we're glad to be sharing the ministry of Redemption Church with you. Now join us as we receive the Word of God. <clears throat> Today, try it, you'll like it, is California Roll! <laughs> Everyone's like, snap, I eat that like every day. I could have gotten free chili. Remember that for next week when it really is spiders. All right. So, Sarah, if you could please take that fork, and if you could try it, we'll see if you like it. She is uh, putting wasabi on it. She's making a mess. Ugh. You know how pastor's wives are. All right, Sarah, you've tried it. I don't like it. She likes it. Yeah. All right, so thank you, Sarah. Here's your prize. Before you leave, you're just like running off stage. One, two, three. Thanks very much for being a part of the game at Redemption Churches. Try it. What's this stuff? It's Jesus. He's supposed to be good for you. Did you try it? I'm not going to try it. You try it. I'm not going to try it. Let's get Mikey. Yeah. He won't eat it. He hates everything. He likes it. Hey, Mikey. Jesus Christ is living and active at Redemption Church. We encourage you to try new things in Jesus at all times. Things like worship. Things like Bible study. Things like gifts of the Spirit. We believe that these things can be beneficial to your life. So try it. You'll like Most it. Most things in life, you can't say you like until you've tried them. And the opposite is true. Most things in life, you really can't say you dislike them until you've tried them. Happy Father's Day, and welcome to Redemption Church. My name is Chris Lewitt. I'm the lead pastor here, and I'm glad that you are here. I want to speak to the fathers for just a moment. Dads, have you ever tried to feed your child? You ever try to feed your child? Maybe when your child was an infant, and you put that Gerber food, that, that strained beet stuff or, or, or spinach stuff or, or I should know this better, sweet potatoes, I know there's some of that, but, but you put that on the end of that spoon and you try to get that food inside of that infant. And there are moments where you have to get inventive in order to get that food in their little sweet kid mouth, right? We got some moves. Uh, everyone knows the airplane, right? The airplane. Look, Choo-choo, it's a train. All right, we got all this fun stuff. All right, look, the train's coming. It's got a delivery. Try this, kid. You're going to like it. All right? There are other ways that I've learned that are kind of the black arts of, of, of feeding um, little children. Uh, blow in the face. <laughs> if they won't take it, you blow in the face. You just go, and they go, no, we just fed them. I'm not proud of that, but it works. So there's your little tip. Dads, right there. So we've got the dark arts of, of feeding uh, babies. Dads, we know that if we could just get the food inside their mouth, they would like it. I mean, that's, that's the major thing. I mean, the, these things don't usually taste terrible. They, they're, they're made for their taste level. So if they would just try it. And then in those certain cases where it might not be the best tasting stuff in the world, uh, we say, okay, well, it's good for you. Maybe they won't like it, but at least we know it's, it's good for you. It's something that your body will like. It's something that you need. It might be disgusting, but... It's good for you. Last week, we challenged you to try what? Let me get my last week's sermon out. Faith. Try faith. We, we invited you to try faith. We told you that faith looks dumb. Faith looks dumb. It looks dumb from the outside. We told you the story of Naaman and how the prophet Elisha told him to dip seven times in the nasty, dirty Jordan River. And from the outside, looking in, you could say that looked dumb. Naaman had problems with it. He really wanted to go back home and be all mad about it. But that's from the outside. How it looked from the inside, 
From the inside, it looked powerful. From the inside, it looked miraculous. From the inside, it looked holy. It looked like God from the inside. It looked life-changing because Naaman tried it. And once he was on the inside, once he, he dipped one time, two times, three times, four times, five times, six times, it still looked dumb. But he dipped that seventh time time and it looked like healing it looked like the leprosy was gone forever you see from the outside in faith looks dumb the things of God sometimes look dumb from the outside in but from the inside they are everything we need they're everything we want can I get an amen in the house of God anybody ever tried him and knows that that's true This is a trend that continues throughout the Bible. From the inside, sorry, from the outside of the tabernacle, the tabernacle that was portable that the Israelites carried throughout the wilderness, it was basically a makeshift tent covered in camel hair. Camels are known for their beautiful hair. No, they aren't. Anybody wearing camel skin jackets today? Anyone? No, no, no one, right? From the outside, it looked kind of dumb. Look, kind of, what in the world is this? But you walk inside that tent. If you ever walked inside that tabernacle, it's beautiful. You walked inside that tabernacle, there were precious fabrics everywhere. There was a sweet, burning incense. There was gold everywhere. And most important, the very presence of God was inside that tabernacle. You see, from the outside, you're like, why would anyone want to go in there? But from the inside, you say, why isn't the entire world here? And why would anyone want to leave this place? Living for God from the outside is difficult. Living for God from the inside is beautiful. If you're trying to live for God by just keeping some rules, by just going to church every so often, as good as that is, I'm telling you that that's, that's trying to live for God from the outside looking in. But if you ever got in the middle of Christ, if you ever got into the middle of what God's doing, if you ever got in the middle of his love, man, you, got, you start living for God from the inside out, then it becomes beautiful. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Does that sound like something you'd like? Yeah. I'm talking to people in this house. Does that sound like something you would like? Yeah. Would you like God's strength? Yeah. All right, y'all stick with me. I'm going to preach to y'all, all right? I want y'all to preach with me. Does that sound good to you that, that you would have the very strength Of God. Well, let me tell you, you can't get that strength from the outside. You get that strength through Him. You have to go through Him. You have to get on the inside. You can't get that until you've tried God. You can't do it. You see, God has this this whole thing set up that you have to taste in order to see. Taste and see that the Lord is good. That's what Psalm 34 and 8 says. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Living for God is beautiful from the inside. This really interesting choice of words. It says taste. Can you taste something by looking at it? You can look at that from across the room, but you can't taste it. You really can't see that it's good until you've tasted it. You can put your hand on it, touch it. Mmm, mashed potatoes, my favorite. Mmm. No, it doesn't work that way. You have to put it inside. You see, that's how it works. you got to get on the inside, and then you'll see that it's good. And and blessed is the man who takes refuge where? In him. You see, you got to get on the inside. Living for beautiful Living for God is beautiful on the inside. On the outside, you might shake your head and say, that is really dumb. Try God. Try God and you'll see that he's good. But you got to try him. 
This week, we want to ask you to try prayer. Try prayer. You'll like it. Prayer is one of the most powerful things a Christian can do. Do you believe that? Prayer is one of the most powerful things a Christian can do. It's powerful when we pray. It's powerful when we pray. And it's also powerful when we receive prayer. But whatever side of prayer you're on, it's powerful. If someone's praying for you, it's powerful. If you're praying for someone else, it's powerful. I want to tell you about something new. We've been praying and talking about this sermon and wondering what to do. And so we're, we're going to try something new. It's called the prayer line. Look at somebody and say prayer line. Okay, you can get out your phone right now and, and join this prayer line. We've got something called Group Me. It's a, there's an app for it, but even if you don't have a smartphone, it'll work through text. If you want to join a prayer line, in other words, someone is going to be writing and you'll know about all the prayer needs and you can join in praying for them. But if you also have a prayer need, you can put it out on the prayer line and other people in Redemption Church, and and who else knows where, is going to be praying for your need. If that sounds like something you would like, I want you to join it by texting PRAY to the number 214-232-6315. We will add you to the prayer line. You just text PRAY to 214-232-6315. Please do that. Christians should be praying people. The life of a Christian should be marked by joy, thankfulness, and prayer. Your Bible says that in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Here's verse 16. Be joyful always. Verse 17. Pray continually. Verse 18. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I want you to notice this. Is there a time Christians shouldn't be joyful according to 1 Thessalonians? Is there a time where we shouldn't be praying? Is there a time we shouldn't be thankful? No, in all circumstances. So the life of a Christian should be marked with joy, prayer, and thanksgiving. All Christians should pray. All Christians should pray. Yet, would you agree with me that not all Christians pray? Would you agree with that? Could it be that we are living for God from the outside in? Could that maybe be our problem? That You see, living a life of prayer, I'm going to tell you that that is stepping inside the kingdom of God. That is living for God from the inside out. Out. And if you aren't praying, I'm going to challenge you today to start praying. And I'll go strong enough to say, if you aren't praying, if you don't have a life filled with prayer, that you are not living for God from the inside like you could be. Is that all right? You see, maybe we really haven't tried prayer. Maybe we don't really understand what prayer is. Perhaps your prayer is sick and wrong. Look at somebody and say, you are sick and wrong. No one's saying it. Y'all are all too afraid to say it. I'll say it right over there, Katie. All right. Sick and wrong. Stick with me. I got a biblical thing to tell you about it. I just don't make all this stuff off the top of my head. Well, kind of, Vicky. All right. James chapter 4, verse 3, King James Version Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Maybe you've been around uh, Christian circles and you've heard the term pray amiss or ask amiss. This is basically saying you're praying, but you're doing it wrong. What does this word really mean here? Well, the word um, for amiss in Greek means sick and wrong. It means that it's done incorrectly, that it's not healthy, that it's sick, and it's completely wrong. Could we be praying, but we're doing it in a sick and wrong way? Because that's what James is warning us about. Uh, NIV says it like this, when you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong 
motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. It is possible to pray incorrectly. It's possible to pray incorrectly. We could go down the line. There's a lot of things you could do that the Bible tells you to do, but you could do them wrong. You could worship in a wrong way. You, you could do these things, all right? But, but prayer is one of those things. For your prayer to be sick and wrong. See, the sickness starts where? Where do you think the sickness starts? It starts on the inside. It starts in your heart. It starts with your motives, as the NIV points out. These prayers, do you think they have good results? James 4, 3 says they don't. They don't have good results. Matthew 6 and 7. And when you pray, Jesus says, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Can I tell you? That prayer is sick and wrong when it's built on length. When it's built on the big words you use. When it's built on how many words you use. When it is built on repetitious babbling, that is sick and wrong. That is praying amiss. amiss. It's not about a lot of words. In fact, you could pray a very short prayer and it reaches the throne of God and it could change your life and change someone else's life. Your prayer can be short. That's good news for somebody because you grew up thinking, I need this long, drawn out, florid prayer. I remember growing up, I went to a a restaurant and we sat down, we said our quick, short prayer and then this other family came in and they said their prayer and I just noticed they started and they would never stop. I promise you, at the age of like eight, I, those people went eight minutes. And I was like, wow, I wonder if God likes their prayer more than ours. Maybe we should go back and add a little bit more on to our prayer. No, that's not how it works. It's idolatry. It's paganism to even think that way. That's praying amiss. That's praying amiss. I remember one time. Sarah, you remember very well, we're walking through Target, and we're walking, and suddenly you said, I have this terrible pain, hip, it was in my hip, it was in your hip, and you said, I've got this terrible pain in your hip, and we're walking in uh, the Richardson Target, Beltline, and Plano Road, it's a fabulous Target if, you, if you're looking for one, all right, but we were walking to customer service, and we didn't even stop. We just kept walking, and I said, I'm going to pray right now. And I just said this simple, simple prayer. Jesus, we know you love us. The cross tells us so. Please heal Sarah. What happened, Sarah? No more pain. Healed just like that. We didn't even miss a step. We didn't start fasting. We didn't fall on our knees and say, thou largest God of heaven cometh down. No, it was just that simple. Jesus, we know you love us. Come and heal us. Just that simple. Matthew 6, 8 says, do not be like them. Speaking of the pagans, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Can I tell you that prayer is not alerting God to your need? Prayer is not saying, hey, we're dying here. If you're on a desert island and there's a a plane going overhead, everyone's going, hey, we're down here, we're dying over here. That's not prayer. That's not prayer. God knows exactly where you are. He knows exactly what you need. So prayer is not alerting God because he knows your needs before you ask. Can I... Instead, tell you that prayer is taking your needs that God knows very much about, and it's taking those needs to God's throne and asking him to be Lord over your needs. God, I don't have my act together, but you do. Please come and heal. God, you know my weakness. Please come. You know how I've messed up. You know that I'm not big enough, strong enough, and smart enough. Please come be the Lord over my stuff. Prayer isn't just asking for stuff. I think this is one of the biggest problems in Christianity. Prayer is asking for stuff. No, no, no. 
Now, don't get me wrong. You are asking for things sometimes, but it's not just about asking for stuff. There is a deeper benefit to prayer than that. Time out. Before I tell you about that benefit, you need to be convinced. I hope you convince yourself that God can do something greater than give you what you want. Think about that sentence. Do you really believe that God can give you something better than what you think you really need? See, sometimes we come to God and say, all right, here's the picture, God. That's what I need right there. You see that? You see, let me help you. That's exactly what I need right there. Nothing else, nothing else. Do you believe that God can do something greater than your picture? You need to know that. You need to convince yourself of that. He knows. The stuff you have been praying to receive, you need to believe that God can do greater. We pray amiss when we think prayer is about getting stuff. Again, James 4.3 told us that. There is a deeper benefit to prayer than asking God to do stuff or give us stuff. I want to talk to you about agreement. This is a very important point when it comes to prayer. Kingdom agreement. Agreement is essential to God's plan. You see, God created the world and he gave commands to Adam and Eve. Here's some of the commands. Be fruitful. Multiply. Name the animals. Tend the garden. Don't eat that tree. These were agreements. And guess what? Adam and Eve, they kept to the agreement. They, they were fruitful. They did name the animals. They did tend the garden. And for a while, they didn't eat of that tree. But then they did, didn't they? Yeah. I want to tell you that they had a relationship with God through agreement. As long as they were in agreement with God, they had a perfectly fine relationship with God. But it's when they broke agreement, that's when they were suddenly afraid of God and hiding from God and scared that he was going to destroy them. Amos 3.3 3 asks us this question. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Every time we come to uh, connect groups, we do an agreement prayer, right? We tell you we believe in the literal power of agreement and we throw out three statements and say, do you, uh, does everyone agree uh, that God is good? And someone says, yeah. I agree, yeah. And somebody says that it's really good to be with friends today. And then we say another third thing, that Jesus loves us. And we all agree. And then we pray. And the, the Bible says there's power in agreement. There's agreement right here with God. And there's agreement with other people. When people have a disagreement, that's when relationships get all kind of rocky. Everyone gets the point of this, right? All right, good. I'm glad you're following me. When Adam and Eve fell into sin, they fell out of agreement. God attempts to redeem and restore mankind through something called covenant. Maybe you've heard that word thrown around. Covenant is just simply another word for agreement. All right, you messed up on this agreement? Here's a new agreement. Agreement with God is essential to a relationship with God. In order to be saved and know God, you have to agree that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he is God's only son. You have to come into agreement. Mankind fell out of agreement in the garden. I want to tell you that prayer, when done correctly, brings us back into agreement with God. Every one of you, when you came to know God, when you came and turned away from sin, what did you do? You prayed. You prayed a prayer of repentance. You prayed a prayer that brought you right back into, say it, agreement. Being in agreement with God and his kingdom is better than receiving any of the stuff you've been praying for. When Jesus instructs the people on how to pray, he tells them to pray, Matthew 6, 10. Why don't you read this with me? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is agreement. God, let your kingdom, let what you think is good, 
What, let what you think is holy and acceptable, let that come right down to earth. We are agreeing with your kingdom. We aren't saying, Lord, let earth come to heaven. What a mess that would make of heaven, right? Oh, yeah, but what if heaven came down to earth? God, what you think is good, let it come right down to my home. Let it come right down to my heart. Let it come right down to this situation I'm so worried about. Let heaven show up right here. I agree with heaven. That's the power of agreement. Jesus instructs us to pray in agreement with heaven. God, let your kingdom come to my life. Let it come to this earth. Let your will be done. In God's kingdom, there is love. If you are praying in a way that doesn't come into agreement with love, you're praying amiss. You agree with that? Lord, I want you to show those people and bash them over the head and get them real good. Make them real sorry they ever mess with me. That's sick and wrong. That's not love. You aren't in agreement with the kingdom. In God's kingdom, there is righteousness. If you are praying in a way that doesn't come into agreement with that righteousness, you're praying amiss. In God's kingdom, there is no greed. Can I get an amen on that? In God's kingdom, there is no greed. But if you're praying in a greedy way, in a materialistic way, that's all about what I want, and I want these things, and I want them better than what they've got, and I want them now, guess what? Are you going to get what you're asking for? No, you're praying amiss. You're out of agreement with God's kingdom. God's kingdom is about serving others. So if you are the center of all your prayers, if you are self-centered right in all your prayers, you're praying amiss. Do you get it? Does that make sense? You see, prayer is about the power of kingdom agreement. Can I tell you, this is real subtle. You got to get this. In this way, coming into agreement is way more powerful and important than receiving the thing you need. Where does the power come from? Being in agreement with him. Where does the joy come from? Is there going to be a better joy found in the kingdom? Is there going to be a better love found in the kingdom? Is there going to be a better peace that you're looking? Is there a better healing than the one that flows straight down from heaven? No, no, no. You see, coming into agreement with the kingdom is way better than receiving the stuff you've been asking. Do you really believe that? I want that to change the way you think when you pray. It's no longer about that stuff. It's like, where's God and how can I get in agreement with him? It'll bring you to repentance every time. It'll bring you back to a focus on the kingdom. It'll bring you back to a focus on loving others like Jesus loved them, forgiving others like Jesus forgave them, serving others like Jesus served them. Man, what if every Christian prayed and let God bring him to that place? When you are in agreement with God and his kingdom, you will receive. I'm not telling you you won't receive. I'm telling you that it's secondary. You will receive what you're praying for. Because now that you have the proper motive, remember the motive that, that James 4, 3 said, that you have the wrong motive, you're not going to receive what you want because you're just going after your own pleasure. Now that you have the kingdom motive, God can give you what you want. Amen. Now that you're in agreement with his kingdom and his will, the things you're praying for, you will receive. You will receive the fullness of that kingdom. And that's really what you wanted all along. You are praying God's kingdom right into the middle of your problem. You're praying God's kingdom right into the middle of your world. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. When you are praying for someone to be healed, what you're really praying for is God. Let your kingdom, where there's only healing, where there is no death, where there's only victory, let that kingdom come right now in the middle of that cancer problem. Let it come right now in the middle of that hospital room 
or wherever you're at. You could be on the side of the road where there's been a terrible wreck and you don't know what else to do. So you just said, God, the only thing that could save us right now is your kingdom being present right here. That is agreement that is bringing heaven down to earth. Lord, let your kingdom come into the middle of my problem. The power is in the kingdom coming to earth. It's not in the words you say. The power is in Jesus Christ and all of his domain coming upon the scene. You see, that is where the power is. It's not in saying the right words. It's not in having florid language. Kingdom come. Close your eyes for a second. Say that. Kingdom come. Wherever you are, if you're watching this on the internet, you close your eyes. You do it. God, let your kingdom come right now. It's what I've been needing all along. It's what I've been needing all along. Let your kingdom, let it come. Try that. Try that. You'll like it. Try that. You'll like it. You need to try this kingdom. Try coming into agreement with God and his kingdom. Could it be, could it be that we have made prayer about Asking for blessing. It's all about blessing. God, we want that blessing. Without ever asking God to make us blessable people. See, I keep going back to James 4, 3. You see, that kind of prayer, that sick and wrong prayer, was not blessable. It had the wrong motives. You see, prayer shouldn't just bless you. It should make you blessable. We serve a happy Father's Day. We serve the Father in heaven. And if his kids need bread, does he give them a stone? No. If they need a fish, if they need provision, does he give them a snake? No. He gives them exactly what they need because they're his children. See, if you are a blessable child of God, if you're living that life that's in line with the kingdom, you are blessable. He will not withhold any good thing from you. Every good thing. It's yours. It's yours. It's yours. How powerful is that? How powerful is prayer? Prayer doesn't just bring change to the situations around us. It brings change to us. Forgetting to pray is like forgetting to breathe. Forgetting to pray is like forgetting to breathe. Let me explain. If you are a Christian, That means you are a kingdom person. You are God's kingdom person. You are a citizen of heaven already if you're a Christian. Everyone follow me. Does this make sense? That's some good news right there. So guess what? You're supposed to be living on earth in agreement with his kingdom. And you should be interacting with that kingdom because you are a citizen of that kingdom. I want to tell you that prayer is your interaction with that kingdom. If you're supposed to be living in that kingdom, if you aren't praying, that's like forgetting to breathe because you're supposed to be living in that kingdom. Does that make sense? Are you with me? To say you are in God's kingdom but never pray is like forgetting to breathe in this world. Do you pray? Are you lining up? With God's kingdom, are you interacting with God's kingdom? Dads, are you praying for your family? Are you lining your family up with the kingdom of God? Are you lining up your children in your marriage with the kingdom of God? Are you asking God's kingdom to come down into your latest argument? Are you asking God's kingdom to come down in your latest worry, in your latest fear, the latest doctor's report, asking his kingdom to come right down. So we need to pray, right? Yeah. Good. Yeah, I'm glad you all got that. It's good. Everyone's got that. But praying's hard. Raise your hands if you kind of agree with that statement. Praying's hard. I have trouble praying, right? Let's be honest here. Praying's hard. Praying's hard. If you feel that prayer is hard, I want you to listen closely. It doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be hard. Talking talking to someone you love, talking to someone that you actually want to talk to, isn't hard. 
You agree with that? There's some people that when your phone lights up and you see that it's them calling, you're like, oh, I got to do this. Hey, you want to talk to that person. See, prayer should be just like that. You want to talk to this God. You want to talk to your Father in heaven. Looking, I want you to look at this heartfelt prayer from a priest named St. Francis going to throw it up on the screen for you to see. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. It goes on. O oh, divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in dying to self that we are born to eternal life. There's a prayer by St. Francis. That's a beautiful prayer, right? Those are beautiful words. If you have trouble praying, here's just a suggestion. Here's a little tip. Maybe you look at someone else's prayer. How was someone else praying? Look in the Bible because there's a lot of people that pray. There is the Lord's Prayer, right? There's a lot of prayers. There's, there's prayer books. If you're having trouble praying, look at someone else's words. Let those words inspire you. There was some kingdom language. See, the power in this prayer is not in the words of St. Francis. It's that, that those words are so lined up with the kingdom. Do you see kingdom motivation in those? Yeah. Oh God, help us to love and not just seek to be loved. Help us to serve and not just seek to be served. Lord, it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning others that we're pardoned. Do you see the kingdom language in that? So look to the kingdom, look to the things of the kingdom, look to other people that are kingdom focused. Let that be your motivation, let that be your jumping off point to prayer if you have trouble praying. I want to tell you that the make me prayer is so much more effective than the give me prayer. The first words of St. Francis' prayer are make me, Lord make me an instrument of your peace. So time out. Anytime you're you're going down that line, you're trying to pray, and you're like, God, I I want you to give me some money, and then I want you to give me uh, some revenge over there, and then I want you to give me this thing, and I I need a a new fuel pump, so give me one of those. uh, Stop that. Make it a make-me prayer. Make it a make-me prayer. God is not a vending machine. Well, I'll take one of those in uh, B5, and then I'll take one of those over there, uh, C12. He's not... That, he's the maker of heaven and earth. He's the creator. He will do so much more than give you. He's the one who made you. Let him make you. If you're having trouble with prayer, you could look to how others pray. That's, that's good. Um, you could look over this prayer. And then you could pray it from your own heart. So you aren't just reciting, because it's not just about repetition, right? We read that in James 4. As you read these words, be aware of what the Spirit might do. So we're praying, and we're saying, God, make me an instrument of your peace. God, I have not been very peaceful, have I? God, help me be peaceful. Help me to stop arguing. And where there's hatred in my life, help me to love. And then, oh, that's where the Holy Spirit might talk to you and say, you haven't been loving this person. So wait on that a little bit. God, I'm going to start praying for that person. And God, forgive me for hating them. And God, right now, I'm going to change. I'm going to change. Do you see how that is? That's where the Holy Spirit interacts. Has anyone ever experienced the Holy Spirit where you're praying and he leads you in how to pray? That's the, that's the Holy Spirit. In fact, in heaven right now, the Holy Spirit is interceding for you. The Holy Spirit is praying for you. That, that God, that, that Jesus ever lives to make intercession for us. God is praying on your behalf right now. Jesus is praying on your behalf right now. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. 
So as you read words, as you read the Bible, and the, the Holy Spirit talks to you, work on that. Get that right and change your prayer to a make me. God, change me. How, how does this situation change me? Instead of always praying, God, change this situation. God, what is this situation trying to change in me? You might feel drawn to pray these things for someone else. So pray for them. That's, that's intercession. I remember one time I was a really young kid and I was praying. And I, I, I still do this. I start with repentance. God, forgive me of my sin. And while I'm praying repentance over myself, I feel God's spirit direct me to a person. Someone I had beef with. Someone I had problems with. Someone that has kind of hurt my family. And it was evident to me, okay, you're praying for your forgiveness? Cool. Pray for them. Pray for their forgiveness. Pray for their redemption. Pray that all their sins would be eradicated and not held against them. Well, I started to pray for them. And something really kind of supernatural happened. I felt like my heart. I felt all these emotions come on to me. That's not so... uh, unusual for me, but I felt like my heart just was heavy and big. And I was just like, whoa, God is giving me just these super powered emotions for them. I started praying in ways for them. I just didn't even understand. I started speaking in other tongues. And I, when you do that, you don't even know what you're saying, but the Holy Spirit is praying from inside of you, outside of you. And if you think that's weird, that's okay. I would just tell you, try it. You'll like it. So I pray for this person. Then I, I, I ran into this person's son-in-law. And I just had to tell them, man, your father-in-law, I was praying for him. And something just supernatural happened. I just started praying for him. And I just tears started flowing. I was just praying that God would bring him back to him. That God would do something. And I felt my heart just grow big and heavy. And that my friend said, wait, what did you just say? You felt your heart do what? I felt my heart grow big and heavy. And he says, he was just diagnosed with an enlarged heart yesterday by the doctor. I didn't know that. The Holy Spirit knew that. The Holy Spirit inside of me was praying redemption for this man. Not only is this man alive, is his heart healthy, but he's serving God today. That's the power of prayer. That's the power of coming into alignment and agreement with the kingdom. Would you like that kind of powerful prayer? Where you are doing something and you just don't even know, but then God pulls back the curtain. You go, what? God, you're so smart. God, you're so powerful. And you are using me. Would you like that? God can do that in your life. You can also use scripture to help you pray. I know a lady with a great testimony. She is an absolute firecracker for God. If God tells her to do something, look out. She's going to do it. She had just come to know Jesus, and she wanted to be set free from a drug addiction she had had for years. It had controlled her life, but now she wants Jesus to control her life. Praise God. And you know, chemical addictions can be very hard to overcome. And at night, she had trouble sleeping. She had fear and paranoia attacking her. That's not so unusual for coming off of of drugs. And she felt like she was going to die every night. Every night she was just sweating and she was all alone in this. All of her friends had left her. It's just her and Jesus. And she remembered, she talked to her pastor, what do I do? And she said, the pastor said, uh, well, Have you ever prayed before? And the lady said, I don't really know how to pray. I don't know any prayers. I don't know how to pray. And so the pastor asked her, do you know any scripture? She only knew about half of the 23rd Psalm. And that pastor says, you pray scripture. You pray scripture. You hold on to that in your heart and you say it when you don't know what else to say. You start quoting the 23rd Psalm. So here she is, it's nighttime, and she's all alone, she's scared and afraid, she's tempted that she might fall back into her drug habit, and she literally felt like a demon was present, and that was in the room with her, and she was frightened, you get the picture. So 
She's feeling all this stuff and she starts to quote the 23rd Psalm. But all she could remember were the first few words in that moment. All she could remember was the Lord is my shepherd. And she starts praying those few words. Word. She starts holding on to whatever she could remember and she starts saying, the Lord is my shepherd and she's terrified and she's afraid but she starts declaring in this dark room with no one around, the Lord is my shepherd and with every time she said it, she got more bold and she felt the strength of the Lord come into that room. She felt the peace of God come into that room and she felt fear and all those things, all that paranoia, all that temptation left. Was it the beautiful words of her prayer? Was it the amassed knowledge of the Bible she was able to lean on? No. But she walked in what she did know. I'm not telling you to become a Bible scholar. I'm telling you today, walk in what knowledge you do have of Jesus Christ. Try it. You'll always like it. What a wonderful testimony. I tell you what, that prayer works. Whatever you're going through right now, Teresa would tell you, you just say it. You just say, the Lord is my shepherd. Problem, get out of here right now. You can pray scripture and you can pray it for yourself. Let's look at the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in one. Now you can pray this for yourself. You can pray this. You don't even have to use these words exactly. You can say, God, you're all I want. That's what it's trying to say. You're all I want. You could spend some time saying that. And it's powerful. It'll clean you out. God, I, I've been going after these other things. You're all I want. But there's another way you can pray this. You can pray this for someone else. You can pray this for your children. Lord, you are the shepherd of my little boy, William. You are his creator. You're his shepherd. God, I want you to be all that he wants. Wants. I want you to be all that he wants in this life. And it goes on. God, I want you to, to bring him down into beautiful green pastures. He is your little sheep. I want you to lead my little boy beside your still waters. I want you, and so you're praying scripture for someone else. You don't know how to pray? Try this. You'll like it. And then invite, be sensitive because the Holy Spirit is going to move and he's going to start talking to you. We aren't just going through some simple exercise. No, God is on the scene. Are you glad God's on the scene? Prayer is talking to God. And we come to this altar every time we gather and we talk to God. That is prayer. I want Katie to come. I want to give you... Just a little bit of stuff. I, I just really felt like we needed to talk about some stuff. So let me be pastor for just a second. We have prayer in this altar. And maybe, maybe you're new to this. I can get that. Uh, maybe you uh, kind of come down here, but maybe you've never come to the front. Or maybe you're nervous every time. I want to remind you. Uh, we might turn on these lights so people can see me. Um, I want to remind you, we don't mess with you. We don't come and pray with you unless we have your permission. And we know we have your permission to pray with you if you come in the first two feet. Everybody understands that. Everybody understands that. So if you come up to this, if, up to this altar area, you're perfectly fine. No one's going to bother you if you have any worries about that. Is that cool? Is that all right? Yeah. Now, maybe you've seen some people come up to the front. Sean, would you come up here? Sean is going to just uh, act this out. So Sean's going to come to the first two feet. Ever see something like that happen? And then one of the pastors of this church comes up to Sean. And what happens is we talk to Sean. We don't just immediately hit Sean and like knock him over and then everyone dances around Sean. Nothing like that happens, amen? amen. We talk to Sean. You wanna know the kind of things we say? Here they are. If we don't know this guy's name, we say, hey, what's your name? Sean. You, my name, your name's Sean, my name's Chris. I'm really glad you're here. Then we say, <laughs> nice to meet you. We say, how can we pray for you? How can we pray for you? That's one of the questions we ask. And we listen. We spend a lot of time up here praying for people, listening. We want to understand what the situation is. Now, sometimes people come up here and they know exactly what it is they need. But sometimes people just come up here and they say, I don't know what I need. I just, I just feel God. I want, will you pray for me? And so we just pray for them 
right there. And sometimes, sometimes when we feel led, we'll say, hey, do you know what repentance is? And we'll lead them to repentance. And we'll, we'll just pray a very simple prayer. If you've ever wondered what goes on up here, that is what goes on up here. Try it sometime. Try it sometime. You'll like it. Thank you, Sean. You've tried it before. You like it? Yes. Right on. The Bible talks about prayer. And it, it talks about prayer. And if you read how the Bible does it, you would look at churches nowadays and say, well, that's nothing like the Bible. For instance, very few churches believe in the power of laying your hands on someone to pray. Or being instant in prayer. You, a lot of times they'll say, oh, you need me to pray? Well, I'll pray for you later. No, Bible's very clear. Someone needs prayer? Pray right now. We pray continually. Let's pray right now. If we're in the middle of the supermarket, let's pray right now. I was at a family reunion yesterday, and someone came up to me and said, I'm, I'm just so worried about someone I need it. And said, well, let's pray right now. We had prayer meeting right there in a parking lot. Pray right now. And the laying on of hands, that might creep you out, all right? It's, it's biblical. They just laid hands on them and prayed. Now, let me tell you what I don't believe in. I don't believe in the lay our hands on them and then knock them to the ground. No, we don't believe that at all. That is not done around here. But sometimes we'll lay our hand on your shoulder. Sometimes we'll just take your hands. What are we doing? We're a first century church. We're just trying to be obedient to God. That is prayer. That is the power of laying on of hands. And if you are sick, the Bible is very clear on what you should do. It says that you should call for the elders of the church to come and pray for you. If you're sick, if you've gotten a bad doctor's report, call us. We'll be there. If you are just not feeling very good, call us. We'll be there. I remember when I was young, I was, uh, I was in uh, a junior in high school. I broke my ankle play, playing tennis, and we were on our way. I'm like, get me to the hospital. Let's go to see the doctor. And my dad said, we will, but first, we're going to go see the pastor. And we made some phone calls, and we met some people over there, and they prayed for me. God healed my ankle. Why? Because the power of those prayers? No, the power of coming into agreement with the kingdom that's where it's at see it's not the power of the pastors here it's the power of coming into agreement some of you need to come up to this altar today and ask for prayer not because you really have a lot of faith in the, the man of God but because you want to come in agreement with his kingdom man that's where the power's at that's where everything you need is already at and there, there's one more thing um, laying on of hands. Look, I'm, I'm drawing to a close. I want you to all stand. You see, the best teacher on how to pray is Jesus. In Luke 11, people ask Jesus, Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. They just came right out and asked him. I want you to know that the Lord Jesus wants to teach you how to pray. Redemption Church, we should be people of prayer. But not just, we, we know how to pray because pastor has taught us, but, but out of this relationship with Jesus, we've asked him, God, you direct me, you lead me, you help me be a better prayer person of prayer. He will teach you how to pray. If you don't know how to pray, then you need to make your prayer today. God, show me how to pray. Get a hold of my heart. Put me in alignment with your kingdom, even if it brings me to tears. Bring, put me in alignment with your kingdom. Put me on the potter's wheel and just mold me and make me. See, God isn't looking for professional prayer people who have all the words to say and know exactly how to say it. He is looking for someone to talk to him and have a relationship with him. And that is what is so amazing. Paul says this. This is the confidence that we have in God. That he answers our prayer. Nope. That he works miracles when we pray. No. Here's what he says. That he hears us when we pray. You see, the most amazing thing about prayer is your Father in heaven will actually listen to you. 
Even when you're praying stupidly, sick and wrong, he listens to you. Even when you're far away from him and a sinner, he listens to you. Your father in heaven, that should be your confidence that when you pray, he hears you. I want to tell you God is in this place. He wants to have a relationship. With Thank you for joining us. For more information about redemption, look us up online at redemption-church.com. And be sure to connect with us on Facebook and Twitter.